Good morning. I was in the 10th grade when I first realized what I really wanted to do in life. You see, I'd always loved building things. So, influenced by the increasing rape cases in Delhi, I decided to build an anti-molestation device. This is an early prototype of the device. I made it of the cheapest material I could find, wood. The device had three basic features. Number one, it basically measured the nerve speed of the person wearing the device. When the nerve speed crossed a certain threshold, 119 meters per second, it gave out an electric shock of 0.08 milliamperes, enough to temporarily paralyze the molester and give the victim a chance to run away. Second, the device had an inbuilt camera and would take 300 non-stop photos of the attacker and the crime scene. These photos went through facial recognition. The exact matches were sent to the nearest police station. And number three, the device would send an SOS message to the victim's family slash friends and would send it with her GPS location. I built this very crude prototype and I sent it to my childhood hero. And thank you. I sent it to my childhood hero uh, and the former Indian president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Dr. Kalam, the great man he was, uh, invited me to IM Ahmedabad and he helped me make this device a reality. Dr. Kalam gave me a patent for this device, which I later open sourced, to allow anyone anywhere to work on my work, to build on my work. As a 10th grader, this experience was incredible. I realized for the first time technology's ability to help people I genuinely cared about, right? I first realized at this age my ability, like technology's ability to right social wrongs, and I loved that feeling. A few years later, I attended Stanford, uh, studying computer science with a focus in artificial intelligence. And at Stanford, I co-founded CS Plus Social Good, Stanford's first student group at the intersection of computer science and social impact. I joined the Stanford computer science faculty to help other Stanford students help people they cared about using technology. We worked with Black Lives Matter, Washington Post, Akshay Patra, governments in Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, Bangladesh, US, UK, India, and beyond. We worked with over 40 countries and helped over 30 million people. And I'm going to quickly discuss three projects that our students worked on to give you an idea of what, the, what was the kind of stuff that the students worked on. The first one is something called Planned Parenthood, or NARO. In the US and Canada, there are often thrice as many fake abortion clinics as real ones. They're called crisis pregnancy centers. They're federally funded, government funded clinics that have fake doctors and they advise women to not get abortions, especially when it's medically safe for them to get abortions. We built a very simple Chrome extension that allowed women in the United States and Canada to look over the abortion clinics near them and identify the fake ones from the real ones. How did we do that? We built an AI model that would basically go over the website of these clinics and identify their language as pro-choice or anti-choice. We worked with the United Nations to make it easier for refugees to live in the new countries that they have adopted. Every year, just to give you some context here, for Arabic, the number of books translated into Arabic in the last 1,000 years is less than the number of books translated into Spanish in the last month. So if you're an Arab Arabic-speaking refugee, the only way, in most cases, for you to learn about your new country is to learn English, which is a very time-consuming project. Our students work with publishing firms and made it easier for people who speak Arabic to learn this content on a website that we built for them. Finally, we worked with Safe City, based in Delhi, and we, made, we, we mapped existing sexual assault report cases and like, mapped the safest route, safest walking route, from location A to location B, based on existing locations for these cases. And this is a very, very popular app on the Play Store right now. Today, CS the Social Good is easily one of the largest organizations on campus. And we have moved beyond just Stanford to countries all across the globe. We are now present in MIT, Princeton, Harvard, U Cornell, U Chicago, Georgia Tech, and in China and India and Brazil and more beyond. Students who worked in CS Plus Social Good have helped thousands of people using technology. And here's the simple truth. The first thing I want you to leave with today. Technology amplifies existing human intent and capacity. There is little technology can do if the right intent and capacity don't exist on the ground. In my travels across India, I have seen an infinite reserve 
of the right intent and capacity on the ground. Every village I visit, and I visited a lot, I find infinite right, like infinite right intent and capacity. Every person I meet in the village wants to move out of poverty. They want to help their family, and they want to build a better life for themselves. And it is our job to use technology to help them. So almost a year ago, I graduated from Stanford, and I'm currently working on two projects that I'm going to talk about. I have been tackling extreme poverty using technology, but before I get to that, I want to talk about another project. This one's called Project Janta. So when I moved back to India, I expected my work uh, on tackling poverty to be harrowing. I expected to feel jaded, to feel disappointed at the lack of progress and the magnitude of the challenges we face. Mainstream media, especially abroad and also in India, paints such a bleak image of our villages and our country that it almost feels like nothing good has ever happened or will ever happen. That is obviously not true. In the last one year, I have visited over a thousand villages across this country, and you can pinpoint to any place on that map and I'll tell you an inspiring story. And I have found an infinite, like an insane number of good work happening on the ground. I met countless young and old people, sorry, countless young and old people who are fighting the good fight, who are refusing to give up on India, and in turn helping millions of people, picking them with themselves. And today I want to mention some of these stories. But most importantly, you know what I realized was most Indians didn't know these people, right? One hour from this school is Bankai Roy. And Bankai's work has helped move 30 lakh people out of poverty. One man, one lifetime, 30 lakh people, but most Indians don't know about him. Most Indians don't know about Dr. Abraham George, whose school Shanti Bhavan, just one hour from Bangalore, is considered one of the best schools on the planet. He works with underserved Dalit populations across the south, southern India sector. Most people don't know about Kudumbashri, the world's largest cooperative, 50 lakh women who move themselves out of poverty by learning how to sell coconuts. Right? We don't know these stories because we haven't been taught these stories. My goal with Project Janta is to help Indians meet the real India, to recognize the amount of good work that is happening on the ground and learn from it. Instead of focusing on what's wrong with our country, I want to focus on people fixing those wrongs. I started Janta with one of my best friends, Divya Siddharth, who went to Stanford with me, and she is currently studying youth movements in our country. And right now, you can go to projectjanta.com and read these stories. And it's important that we share these stories and understand what the real reality on the ground is. And now I want to talk about my baby, Project Karya. Project Karya is something I'm really passionate about. The goal behind Project Karya is to help move Indians out of poverty using technology. We do this by giving people jobs. And we do this by giving them dignified digital work, especially to our most disadvantaged populations. So what does that mean? How do we do it? So there are over 1.2 trillion government documents in this country, 1.2 trillion, all handwritten in 3,000 plus languages that our computers don't understand. Now the government really wants to digitize all of these documents, more digital India, more transparency, et cetera. And these jobs would come to people like you and me, people in cities who don't really need these jobs, and our computer scientists. What we have done is taken this work and given it to the villages of this country. How, what does that mean? We take massive amounts of digital work, such as digitizing these documents, divide them into small, small pockets of work, which we call micro work, and crowdsource it to millions of people in rural India using their smartphones. This image was taken in rural Bihar, uh, in a village that borders Bihar and Bengal, and all of these women have never used a smartphone before, and they aced it within 10 minutes of me introducing the smartphone to them. We have worked with Adivasi populations in rural Maharashtra, with Dalit and nomadic communities in Rajasthan, Soda, a village less than an hour from here, uh, with tea workers in Bihar and beyond. Most of our participants make less than $1 a day. And we give them smartphones, they use the smartphones for the first time, they digitize these documents on the smartphone, and they're really, really good at it. How good exactly? Glad you asked. And I said, these are some of the people using smartphones for the first time, digitizing for the first time. How good are they at it? Really good. They achieve a minimum of 97% accuracy in doing this job. 
and I would love for you to guess how much Infosys professionals and city professionals guess, get at the same task. It's less than 60%. So they're not only more accurate, they also do it at a much easier cost, and the model genuinely works. I want to share three quick stories with you. The woman in the first, Suganda, she's really happy because she's seeing the 2,000 rupees note for the first time. They'd heard so much about it. This is in rural Maharashtra in an Adivasi village called Amli. And she was incredibly happy seeing the money and holding it in her hand. That's Aruna. Aruna not only learned how to use a smartphone, she taught her entire family how to use a smartphone and become digitally literate. And that's Surajmal. Surajmal ji lives only one hour from here in Soda, where, and I work with Chavi, who's incredible. Uh, and Surajmal ji can't hear or speak. This was his first job. And he made 3,000 rupees in the first hour of working with us. You see, stories of hope and progress are not rare in rural or urban India. They're more of a norm. We just have to learn to see it through that eye. I believe that it is our responsibility to use technology to amplify the voices of those we have left behind. I believe it is our responsibility to use technology to harness a better world for everyone. Our goal with Karya is to give dignified aspirational work to people so that they have agency and control over their lives. To give them work that gives them enough confidence in their ability to learn new skills and gives them more than enough money to fuel their dreams. Thank you so much. It was so nice talking to you guys. Thank you.